Hi, you're watching the second part of Gadget Nation special with me, Cherish Liao. So last week, we looked at the startup personalities based in Singapore and they shared their stories about starting up the entire journey and all. This week, in the second part, we are speaking to some of the startup mentors and investors based in Singapore. I think there's um, um, two, um, two sides to uh, what is basically the same issue. Um, one of them is um, um, it really does have to be about the business case. Um, um, you know, uh, being in a startup isn't about, um, it's, it's not charity work. Uh, it's about uh, being passionate about building something that um, can um, be reasonably economically viable on its own. Um, and um, um, I think some success stories like Instagram, where someone has bought, built a company which has been sold with no revenues, um, is often misleading to many people who want to go and build startups. Um, you've got to be very passionate about actually building a business that can drive revenues and, and, and deliver a profit. Um, I think the second side of that coin is um, um, uh, don't believe your own bullshit. Um, um, there's a lot of people I've seen who want to be part of the startup community because they see the lifestyle that is there. Um, the, the, the reality is it's, uh, it, it's work. It's, um, it, it, it requires you to work harder, um, have more drive, um, be more flexible in your thinking, um, and um, do a whole wide range of things. Uh, and, and the great things about Inspire Stop and Drive, they, they, they don't happen for free. Um, um, yeah. Um, so I've seen a lot of people who want to go and do startups because they want to wear a t-shirt with the name of their company on it, or they, they want to go to events and conferences, or they want to feel like they're surrounded by incubators and all that sort of stuff. I mean, all those things are helpful and useful, but at the end of the day, it keeps coming back. Um, are, you trying to create some, are you trying to create something really genuinely great? Okay? And, and you can't lose sight of that. The difference is in Singapore is that there's, um, um, and, and I think this comes back to um, heuristics, um, people invest on things they know, um, and they invest and they um, take risks on things that they're familiarized with. In places like Silicon Valley, um, um, there is a very long track record of uh, people and organizations going from startup all along the funnel, uh, um, ultimately to a company that discovers some great exit. Um, and there's people in every part of the ecosystem which understands what that next stage is from 5 to 10 people, from 10 to 15 people, from 15 to 25 people, from 25 people to 50 people, from 50 people to 100 people, from 100 people to 200 people. Here in Singapore, um, 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 what are the heuristics? You either have a bunch of multinationals which come in, and then typically your, um, um, you know, Singapore in this region is the, is the last place the MNC thinks about on the planet, is the where to set up office. So it, invariably it's a conservative MNC teaching locals a range of work practices um, or alternatively it's um, um, it's just full um, it's the current exit environment the current exits don't promote the um, the level of payoffs which give people the sense of what is the next thing um, yeah um, I think ultimately um, it's going to come down to when will the first major exits come I think when that actually starts to happen I think then um, then things will turn on its head very quickly and you can see this is not a startup environment. It's like around Hong Kong and uh, the hinterland in China, in the early days of China, the Chinese internet from about 1998 to about 2004, the more recent boom in, in, in the internet in China. You can see what that in South Korea, you can see that in, in a whole bunch of other ecosystems. Okay? So that this whole thing about risk aversion, it, it's simply for lack of exits and that, that the people haven't seen something that they can recognize at home. Simplicity and focus. I think it's very easy to be so passionate about what you're trying to do that uh, you lose sight of how you're going to get it into the market. So um, the way I like to approach it is I will help them interrogate where the gap is for their market, for their product, um, what target audience they're looking at, why they would be interested in their product. So. A lot of those questions are around simplifying, really understanding what it is they're offering so that they are clear 
on the shift in the market they're looking to make or the difference they're looking to offer. So helping them hone in on what's unique about their product. I think there are great networks out there to, to support women and to help them feel like they're not alone. Um, there's a lot of encouragement. Um, women like Grace who run the hub, they uh, are very supportive of other women founders. So by reaching out and also letting them know that we're around, I think helps women make that first step to reach out and ask for advice or to see if they can find someone else with a similar sort of passion that they could start the business with. So it's really making sure that um, when we're known, we're out there, um, we're supportive, we're collaborative, um, and there are networks, especially for women, to overcome this initial hesitation. One, two, three, four. Okay, roll the drop. I think the culture and the DNA of the company is very important. You know, there was a we heard a comment once that each uh, 27 is like a cult. You know, the way we operate, the way we do uh, our projects, and the way we hire people. And I think. Um, while you want to open up your company to as many people as possible for opportunities, you also want to be very selective and careful of who you bring in. So that that cult-like status, that mentality that sold their DNA is maintained. Because one, at, at such an early stage, right, for, for companies that are like 20 people or less, that one different or wrong person right, could affect the company's culture completely. And that rolls on to its users, to its customers. You know, and the investors can see that from a very early stage. So I think building that, that culture and really enforcing some kind of values, some kind of mission on how things have to be done is very, very core for the company. And then regardless of what the idea the company is working on, what kind of problem space, like, it's that culture, that DNA, that will push the company forward and, and it will allow the, the team to really like, uh, expand and grow. So I mean, in the first place they come to us, right, we pick them up first. So like, uh, it was in 2009, right, there was a company that was doing something quite innovative in the, in the storage space called iTwin that no one wanted to talk to because they just didn't get it. We, we picked them up, showcased them, and then they ended up getting showcased at TechCrunch 50 based on that. So same thing with this uh, Thai company, right. They were a small little company in Thailand focusing on their own space. And we convinced them to come to a larger platform and showcase what they would do. And that's kind of what the business we're in, right? We're helping to build the startup community and by showcasing all these interesting ideas, floating, up, flo floating them up to a platform so that the larger audience will appreciate them, and making them feel like heroes in their, in their own right. Um, and for me, I think, so at the end of the day, right, if, if entrepreneurs had time to spend on one thing, they should really be spending on their customers, right? Serving that customer, making sure that customer ends up really loyal and making and maximizing as much value as they can for that customer. And the media attention will come automatically after that. And that's what I feel like. There will always be someone out there who is interested and passionate enough to cover something different. And, and, it, it, and it could come in through one of your customers and your customers could really like what you do and end up being a media advocate for the business that you're building. Yeah. Looking and borrowing ideas from people is great because you always say there's, no, there's always a saying that in this world there's no new ideas, no original ideas anyway. Everything is just copy and kind of, you know, modify. is the, the, the first thing is the essence of what we do. Um, I think that's how uh, my theory of change is, is you know we are essentially creating a movement here in Singapore. We're creating a counterculture to what has always been a more risk averse, you know, like who cares about pursuing your passion and who cares about giving back, um, not un at least until I'm rich myself kind of uh, mentality, right? So we want to reverse that. And to reverse that, it has to be a movement. 
Um, and so in, in starting the hub, for example, um, I kind of took eight to nine months with my co-founder and you know, all together we might have four to five hundred coffee chats just to sense the pulse of the market, just to see what's really needed without assuming that it's the right time and the right place to be. Um, so that took a while. And that community building kind of lens um, is what we are and it's what differentiates us as well from, from other co-working spaces. Entrepreneurs should be celebrated, they should be grouped together to energise each other, to exchange ideas and to move forward like that, you know. So the, the, the power of a physical space and the power of proximity is, is um, often underrated but um, I, I think we can see it working. The challenges that we face, every entrepreneur, every startup uh, faces challenges, right? And, but I don't really see them as challenges, you know, it's, it's just another hurdle in the game, you know, or, um, and something that we need to be even more determined or innovative to crack, right? Um, for me, the challenge was never with um, the people. So I think um, Singapore-based entrepreneurs and even Singaporeans they are now looking for meaning in life, you know, um, regardless of age. In fact, we, we are seeing a movement where younger people are now immediately entering into a self-actualizing stage and not waiting till they are 50 or 60 to give back, right? So it is this group that, that really interests me as a social entrepreneur and someone who wants to mainstream social entrepreneurship in, in general. Um, we did, in, in the process of starting the hub, there was a need to re-educate the government and to re-educate companies. So um, because, because of how companies are and how government agencies are, um, it's hard for them to see that hybrid models now kind of rock the world, right? Like how do you marry meaning and money and profit and purpose um, at the same time? You know, and to do that, you need to be creative and innovative, um, and have hybrid models, right? So it, it, it took a while to convince uh, some of the key players that uh, we would need in building this community, but it worked at the end. And so right now, we are work, we're working with the government too um, at the hub. Um, when I invest in stuff, I would like to invest in stuff that, I mean, I, I must like the team, the founders, definitely. And I like the idea, I think the idea is uh, market potential. Social impact is great, but it's not that easy because I think if we move on to the topic of social entrepreneurship, there is still a, in my opinion, people still see social entrepreneurship as kind of an iffy thing because if you're social and contributing to the world, how can you make money? Which to me, it doesn't really make sense because for an enterprise to, to continue doing good to the world, you need to be sustainable. So I think that part still needs a bit more market education. But I would love, I, I would love to Im invest and, and I, I always love meeting people who are making big impact, social impact. And yeah, obviously from an investment point of view, monetary return at some point is also obviously good. Yeah. So but always have a portfolio of different stuff. I think Persistence and tenacity is definitely, you know, it's definitely a trait that entrepreneurs should have. If you're not tenacious, then I think it's, entrepreneurship is not for you. In fact, many things in life are not for you. If you're, you know, if you're, if you want to be a pianist, you need to constantly work at it, even when it gets tough. You know, scientifically, it's proven that if you love something, you continue working at it. Doing some parts of it, you would, you'd be very upset. I don't say upset, but you would feel that you do not like it. But it's also proven that after that, once you've achieved a certain amount of competence in it, you actually enjoy it more. So I think people have to learn to get past that and continue working on, on, the, on the company or on a skill. Um, I wouldn't say it stops. I, I see cloning ideas as both good and bad. Number one, I think cloning can be good because if you're very passionate about, about starting a company, and for maybe, for maybe for the right reasons, but you don't really know where to start. Looking and borrowing ideas from people is great because you always say there's, no, there's always a saying that in this world there's no new ideas, no original ideas anyway. Everything is just copy and kind of you know modify it, right? So I believe to a certain extent that's somewhat similar in many aspects. So 
I think there's nothing wrong because you can learn from them. And a lot of it is also about localizing for your, your markets that you're targeting. So that's the good part, you learn. And hopefully when you learn, be it you fail or succeed with that one startup, hopefully you go on and start something else that maybe can change the world. So, so on that, I think that's kind of the good part of it. The bad part to a certain extent is that if someone is purely opportunistic and say has two ideas, one is a, to, to use the term clone, the other is a more transformational, more bigger, you know, bigger goal. But in that entrepreneur's opinion, much harder to achieve. And if the entrepreneur chooses to do it in a sense, the easier one, and there's no such thing as easy, but just more something that's been proven elsewhere, right? In a sense, it's kind of like opportunity cost, right? To a certain extent, I would love for the entrepreneur to have tried to, to work on that bigger idea because hopefully that bigger idea has much more impact. So in a sense, that's taking the entrepreneur away from working on that. But then again, the flip side is that hopefully the entrepreneur learns from the cloned idea. So All around Asia, if, another, if one company succeeds, that's my success as well because it builds confidence amongst investors, it builds confidence amongst entrepreneurs. I guess one they should so anybody that's approaching uh, like a VC for an investment, you basically are looking for money to take you 18 months, at least two years. I would say you're looking for money to take you two years. So one, they should understand uh, what their growth of their company will look like over the next two years and how much money they need. So I see a surprising number of uh, people that just say, "Oh, I need two million dollars," and what for? So I think that's very important. Uh, two is actually putting together a product roadmap, you know, uh, new hires, people that they're going to hire, so that they actually plan it out first. When they come to us, this way when we start shooting them questions, they're kind of mentally prepared to answer them. Um, well, I look at crowdfunding for a startup, it, it can be very difficult. So like Kickstarter in the US, really, really popular, but it, it's not really necessarily funding startups, it's more funding individual products that people want to see in the market. Uh, what I do think is working very well for crowdfunding is the AngelList, uh, which is basically, you know, I have a startup, it goes to an audience that's pretty large. The audience is all accredited investors, but that's still in the tens of thousands. Uh, the only difference is it's not global right now. It's very heavily concentrated in the US. That's one thing that Golden Gate we're trying to help where we can help teams kind of promote themselves on AngelList. We can use our network to help promote them to kind of open that door to the valley that it's not a hard door to open, but typically you need to be there to have that door open for you. Uh, good question. So I, I guess in hindsight, so like I have failures in the past. I have one company that we raised money on and shut down. Uh, in hindsight, I can talk about that as a failure with lessons learned. Uh, but at the time, it's very, very difficult and stressful to realize that. So I, I don't think at the time you're realizing that. It's more kind of after the fact. Uh, and kind of a nice little anecdote. So I had this one company, uh, our CTO, uh, when it basically came to the decision we might be changing direction, our CTO is like, let's just unplug it, stop it right now. Uh, I didn't want to do that. It's like, oh, we have all these users that we're supporting and investors. Uh, but it was actually some of the best advice was to shut it down so that we could actually focus on our new direction because another thing that will kill a startup is lack of focus. And if you try to do more than one thing at once, you're gonna fail. When I look around the world, there are lots of countries all trying to replicate Silicon Valley's success. They all think, oh, let's build a Silicon Valley in Europe, let's build a Silicon Valley in Asia. My own view is that that's wrong-headed. What we need to do is think about building something that grows out of the strengths and weaknesses of where we are right here now. So what emerges in Singapore, in Malaysia, in this Southeast Asian region, will be something that comes from the advantages and special nature of this place, not like Silicon Valley. There'll be some elements of in common, we might use the same technology, but the kind of problems that we address, the way that we address them might be very different. 
So when I look around the world at other kind of technology hubs trying to build success around digital technology, it feels to me that the ones that are succeeding are the ones that are really aware of what makes them special and the ones that build on that. Um, people who just try to replicate something that works elsewhere and try and do it in another place, I think are probably unlikely to succeed. So I'm interested in innovation, I'm interested in seeing the world change because of ideas, not just because of ideas themselves. And that passion about creating change, creating a better future by solving problems, is really what drives me. Uh, I love the way that bringing, it brings together a community of people who all want to solve a problem. I love the way that it creates wealth. Uh, there's a, a great expression that my business partner Meng Wong has, which is that really what we're trying to do here at JFDI Asia is to turn today's company founders into tomorrow's company funders, today's inventors into tomorrow's investors. If you look at what makes a place like Silicon Valley incredibly dynamic, it's the fact that once businesses succeed, once people make a bit of money, the very first thing they do is go and invest it in some friends' businesses. So one person's success fuels the next four or five people and that's what builds this sort of chain reaction uh, and builds the economic success and the excitement of Silicon Valley. We want to see that happen here in Asia. We want to see people have self-confidence, we want to see success happening and I think I love being here because in this kind of an environment it's not a win-lose situation. You know there is this expression kiasu here in Singapore, fear of losing out. Um, all around Asia, if, another, if one company succeeds, that's my success as well because it builds confidence amongst investors, it builds confidence amongst entrepreneurs. Um, I celebrate success wherever it happens uh, and that's what really drives me, seeing people's dreams come true. I think the thing that's great about Singaporean startups is that they're really excited that the scene is here and they want to take part in it and they, they want to get their ideas from the hack stage. They're taking part in startup weekends and hackathons and they're really excited to take part in that community but they want to grow it beyond those initial steps and I think that's fantastic. We were talking earlier that people here need to be hungry and I think there is a set of the community here that's super hungry and willing to go out and try anything. I think on the reverse side, um, there are specific boundaries in terms of how people act socially and what's accepted and what's not accepted and they seem a little more black and white than they do within other technology regions and so I think the teams need to be willing to step outside their comfort zone a bit more and kind of push the envelope and do things that they wouldn't um, initially perceive as being okay. You know, simply emailing your users and saying, hey, you know, we're doing this tell us your feedback, we want to hear from you, or making significant changes that might be a little disruptive and you think, oh, well, people won't be happy with that. Testing that boundary and seeing, are, is that in fact true or is that just my perception of, of my user base? So I think really getting people outside of their comfort zone would be uh, something I would encourage technology companies in Pan Asia to do all across the region. Yeah, you know, which is so ironic because I think Singapore does have some amazing entrepreneurs here. You know, there's um, Gwendolyn Regina at SGE, and there's uh, Carmen Benitez, and there's um, Mary at Splate. I think she's changed the name of her company. But I can think of like dozens of entrepreneurs right now. I can think of Joyce at Geek Girls, and I think of Adriana at Girls in Tech. There is this, these women in technology, but I think if you look at the companies that are really moving forward, perhaps right now only, they're driven by men. I think there's a lot in place right now, and I think it's only growing. I think organizations like Geek Girls or Girls in Tech, there was just a Startup Week in Women's Edition, there's Aging Grace, there's Secret W Business, there's all these networking um, events for women, and they're really encouraging the females to get out and create their own companies or advance their own careers and I think that's the start of something amazing. Um, I do think that women in Singapore do contribute greatly to the success of the technology scene. I mean at my, pers at my events it's usually at a technology event it's going to be like 90% men, 10% women but at my events you'll actually see a 60-40 mix which is great. Yeah. And sure that's not 50-50 yet, but there is a large 
percentage of women who are interested and involved in technology.